listening to the cycling podcast Femina in association with Rafa. Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses across the globe. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Rose Manley. Hi, Richard. <laughs> Sorry. Relegated already. <laughs> and <laughs> Orla Shinoui. Hello. <laughs> that took well, me by that, surprise. That threw you, didn't it? Not expecting that. <laughs> You, by popular request, Rose, you've been bumped up the pecking order. <laughs> no. It's like a, you know, a film poster well, when you get... Hold on a minute. If, that, if we were working by popular request, you would have been bumped right down. That's Why are you true. starting the well, show, Well, it might That's happen. True. I might be. I might eliminate myself from this podcast. I'm Boom. a bit under the weather. Yeah. You can probably hear that. And so I'm not sure my voice is going to... It's going to last this entire oh, episode. I not, eh? <laughs> like, how's your Scottish accent? Oh, um... Oh, hi, the new... <laughs> That's just alienated oh that audience. But <laughs> well, I used to live in Scotland, actually. I should be able to do it better than that. Give me something to say. Nah, that's not my job. That's Orla. not my the, job, Orla. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's just move on. Let's just oh, move on. God, what a terrible start. Um, this is April. We're now into this, well into the season. Mm. Cycling podcast, Femina. We've got lots of interviews uh, this month. And um, we'll hear from some of the, the main protagonists and some of the recent races. And well, let's start with your news roundup, Orla. Right, we'll go from Dwarsdorf Landerin, shall we? Uh, second race win of the year there for Ellen van Dijk uh, from Team Sunweb after Omelette van Het Hageland. Uh, she went on a solo attack again with her signature late race move, this time with about seven kilometres to go. A uh, little surprise that the 2013 World Time Trial Champion was able to solo to the line from there. Three times winner Amy Peters from Bowles Dolmans won the sprint for second ahead of Fleur de Mackay from Sunweb with thirds with Sunweb one and three on the podium. Then on to the Tour of Flanders. Sorry, I, I was saying, we're talking about Scotland, I was saying Flirty Mackay sounds like a very Flirty. Scottish name. <laughs> I know it does slightly, doesn't it? Flirty Mackay. But she's not Scottish. Anyway, Tour of we'll, Flanders. We'll claim her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, like you, I know, like you claim everyone. Hodge. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can't claim anyone I don't think in the next one no no even at a stretch um, we've had five editions of the Tour of Flanders five different winners so far from four different teams and another winner Olympic champion Anna van der Breggen um, she's already won a World Tour race this year with a long solo attack she went 20 kilometres out to win Strada Bianchi this time she went with uh, 27 kilometres to go um, she went actually from a spot that the Peloton should have been wary of. It was pretty much where Elisa Longo Borghini and Ellen van Dijk made their race winning moves whenever they won 2015 and 2014. Um, from a cheese group of nine, Amy Peters of Bold Almond sprinted for second again after Vlanderen. And she became the new uh, Women's World Tour leader. And Annemiek van Floyten from Mitchelton Scott came third. So that gave Bowles a 1 2. It made it a Dutch 1 2 3. And just very briefly, I wanted to say Bowles played an absolute blinder in this race because when van der Breggen attacked, they had three riders in the chase group controlling the action. Earlier in the race, when there'd been a terrible crash at 52 kilometres to go, Christine Majerus did a wonderful job controlling the pace to allow van der Breggen and Chantal Black to get back on again. So a brilliant team performance there. Incidentally, that crash, I don't know if either of you saw it, terrible to see um one fdj rider and here, crashed that, into that's the wall. Thing, that's i think I was, I was watching it on the eurosport player without commentary mm -hmm. and you hear a lot more than from the riders including oh. when you know the racing is on and you can hear the shouts so it's quite it's quite visceral really it to was, watch it i find it but quite that, distressing that crash was very distressing yeah yeah it was chloe hosking he was screaming on the ground and the camera stayed on her I thought quite a while and, and certainly allowed the screaming to continue quite a while if you're a family member watching that would be very distressing even as a fan watching it I don't think we re really needed as much of that but anyway um that was the day before Hosking was due to fly out to Commonwealth Games, which he did remarkably. More on that race in a bit. But also in that crash, Annemiek van Vleuten dislocated her shoulder, popped it back in again herself and then finished third. I mean, we know how hard a rider she is, but that really just um, paints a very vivid picture of that. One thing as well, um, if you watch that race, uh, which you might get to, but did Anna van der Breggen take a gel in the last five kilometres? 
because it looked very much like it. She had a team car coming up beside her, passed something out the window, looked like a jet all the wrapper she threw to the ground, um, which is against UCI rules, isn't it? To have a feed. To have yeah. a feed within the last 10 kilometres. Anyway, um, that's what it looked like to me. So Anna Wanting... van der Breggen did win it, but then might be disqualified now on well, the back of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see any coverage of it afterwards It's met, that mentioned that, which I was a bit surprised by. Um, anyway, watch it, see what you think. Amstel Gold then. Uh, the Dutch world champion Chantal Black from Bowles Dolmans took a home victory against Lucinda Brand of Team Sunweb and Amanda Spratt from Mitchelton Scott. Black's win making it four wins for Bowles Dolmans from seven World Tour races with three different riders. So remarkable. Um, a brilliant race from Amanda Spratt as well. She was just back from having the flu. She had to sit out to get Bevel Game and the Tour of Flanders. Flanders had been a big target of hers. Um, so brilliant recovery from from her and a first World Tour Classics podium for the Australian. Flesh Wallone, again, no live coverage of this race as we saw last year. Really disappointing because it looked like a brilliant race, just as we've seen dominance in the men's Flesh Wallone with Alejandro Valverde. Until this year, at least, um, we see the same rider win the women's version for what is now four years in a row. Anna van der Breggen proving unbeatable on the Murdoch Wee once again to win her fourth consecutive flesh balloon. Ashley Mulman Passio took second for Savello Bigla and Megan Guarnier was third. So another Bowles won three. Um, and the win moved Van der Breggen back into the purple jersey for the Women's World Tour leader, at which she won, of course, outright last year. And a great result for Mulman Passio as well, who finished in the podium for the first time at a World Tour race since finishing second at a stage of the Women's Tour two years ago. And she hasn't been on the podium of a World Tour Classic since Flesh in 2013. So good ride from her. Um, Liège, Baston Liège, again, no live TV coverage. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, we've got the, f- uh, the um, final 200 metres of action during the men's race, which the commentators clearly hadn't been warned about. So they're not following um, the race. They see the riders charging towards the line. No idea of the context. They might as well not have bothered, I, I think, quite frankly. But Anna van der Breggen with the win again, continuing her dominance of the Ardennes Classics. Um, she said it'd be impossible to replicate her triple from last year, but she won two out of three. And that's after coming uh, after winning Flanders as well. So arguably at least as impressive. Amanda Spratt went one better than Amstel Gold to finish second, which which is her greatest uh, result of her career in the classics. And Annemiek van Floyten of Mitchelton Scott finishing third, winning a two-up sprint against Ashley Millman Passio. Um, and then Commonwealth Games, just briefly, Chloe Hosking after that horrific crash at Flanders did get on the plane, did get down to Australia and back on the top step of the podium down under. She's had so many podiums in Europe, um, but no wins since the Cadell Evans road race. Georgia Williams of New Zealand second and Danny Rowe third there. She switched allegiance to Wales after marrying Matt Rowe, Luke Rowe's brother. So a first uh, medal for her um, under the Welsh flag. Um, Hosking won after a lead out from her team captain, Tiffany Cromwell, who we'll hear from a little bit uh, later. And then in the time trial, four years on from claiming bronze in the time trial, Katrin Garfit took a dominant victory on home soil, defeating uh, defending champion Linda Willemsen by 54 seconds. And the bronze medal went to Hayley Simmons of England. Um, and just one uh, footnote to that particular race, a terrible situation for England's Mel Lowther, who flew out to Australia specifically to compete in the time trial, only to discover that British cycling, um, I believe, were responsible for Team England's application, hadn't filled in her forms properly. So she didn't get to compete in the time trial after peaking for it in her early season. She did compete in the road race, which wasn't her aim, but a terrible situation for her. And that, my friends... I think, is a news roundup. No no track racing at the Commonwealth Games. Well, the thing (laughs) is, we didn't cover the track racing from the worlds in my news roundup, and we discussed that. And so I thought, well, do I break with with what we've established now as protocol when the Commonwealth Games aren't as big as the worlds? And I know you want to do it because of Katie Archibald, um, but I also thought... If we can't have flirty Mackay, we've at least got... (laughs) We've yeah. at least but got I did think I did Archibald. think with that news roundup I will have waxed nah, on fine. for more. Yeah, than long I think enough. it was a long enough so. uh, news roundup. All the results from the track race at Commonwealth Games are on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! And tattooed there'll, on your there'll back. Be, there'll, yeah. be, there'll, there'll be complaints about that. Um, but we are focused. I mean, there has been a lot of top class road racing. Some of it we've even been able to watch. On, so, the, on, yeah, the, yeah. on the telly box um, and because we weren't able to see uh, Flesh Loan and Liege Bass and Liege I thought it was well worth getting uh, a report from one of the, the protagonists in Flesh Loan and well Liege Bass and Liege as well um, we're going to hear from Ashley Moulman Passio in, in a moment the Savella Beagler rider from South Africa she was second to Anna van der Breggen at Flesh Loan 
And it's, you know, fourth win in a row for Anna van der Breggen, mm. but it's the closest she's been pushed. And it's the nearest anybody's come to beating her up there in the last few years. And it was a, a really thrilling finish. Uh, the, the door seemed to be closed to Mulman Passio and it, and it just opened and she had a go. And we'll hear in a moment, you know, what it felt like to, as she put it, almost be able to taste victory. So here she is, Ashley Mulman Passio. Flesh is a special race for me. It's always sort of held a special place in, in my my heart. And um, yeah, it's a race that I fell in love with um, the very first year I took part, which um, is 2011. And um, in that first edition that I took part in, I, I actually crashed on, on the technical descent, which we do which we do now just before the um, Sharaf. Um and I was out of contention, um, but I was right up there in my very first edition. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always been a race that has suited me and that I've always wanted to win. And my best result um, so far was um, third place in 2013. So this year, of course, the objective was um, to win. I could almost taste it, you know, and so that makes me even more hungry, <laughs> you know, to come back in, in future years and, and to win because uh, it was a tough final circuit with three climbs and um, yeah going up the Côte de Sharaf the first time there was a really hot pace going into it from Canyon Shram they already forced it on the technical descent and then you know up into the climb and that wasn't really um, a problem for me but as we came over the top I realized that I was alone and I was isolated I didn't have teammates but other teams had more than one rider this is where already I could see Ooh, this is looking a bit dangerous and then just as I thought a breakaway went and it had Bulls, it had Canyon and it had uh, Mitchell and Scott and that was a dangerous move. After the move to Hui, um, Cecily Ludwig um, came came back and she did an incredible job um, to control the gap to the breakaway. Um, she really, really emptied herself because there wasn't much cooperation. Um, I actually went up to Sunweb and to Wiggle and said, so what are you going to do? Are you going to chase? And both of them actually came back to me and said, no, going into the Cote de Chiraffe for the last time, um, she really went deep um, to, to limit the gap. And as we entered it, I passed her and I knew she was done. And now it was finally all up to me. It was a, a very tactical sort of situation because if, if the gap was brought down too fast and we rejoined the front group, then this attack, counterattack would just happen all over again. Um, so we tried to time it in such a way that that it happened literally on the mid and that all worked out exactly according to plan. So as we entered into the mid for the final time, um, we could see the four riders just ahead of us. It was just a couple of meters and yeah, that's when I already started to go on the front to make sure that we joined sooner rather than later because the mirror is quite a, a special um, case you know if you you have to you really have to um, do it carefully because if you go too hard at the bottom you can blow completely blow at the top and you can go from being first to finishing out of the top 20 mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a it's a really special line you know between giving it your all but without emptying the tank and as we caught them um that's when i started to feel that i was becoming a little bit boxed in you know i'd actually done some homework the days before to see what riders like belverde and the specialists do um on the meet to to see where they go and I'd kind of pinpointed my, my spot where I wanted to go. And, and this was, you know, to still keep it into my strengths, which is to use the steep part, um, but not too soon um, that I blew before the finish line. And so at the very moment where I really knew that I wanted to go, um, I found myself completely boxed in. So that was for, for me a, quite a frustrating experience. You know, I knew inside that, that that's, that's what I, I really wanted to go. Um, but there was, just no way out and so finally when I managed to force my way out it had already flattened off and you know my ultimate mm. spot had had come and gone it's the first time that I really felt that bulls felt really threatened you are listening to the cycling podcast Femina supported by Rafa celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004 
So that was Ashley Moolman Passio. Interesting as ever, uh, her insight into what happened in Flesh Loan Essential as well to get that because we didn't mm-hmm. see much of it. We did see the the final climb and it, it was, you know, it was it was touch and go really, a really exciting finish to the race. Because I was going to ask, I mean, Anna van der Breggen has been quite dominant on the, on the face of it and Flanders in particular, when you watched her, the way that she won that, you think, you know, when races are, when there's one dominant rider like that, the races aren't that, often that exciting but Flesh Flown was really exciting and and it is a finish that really suits uh, Ash, Ashley Moolman and she, she's obviously proven that she's very strong there but some really interesting insights she studied Valverde and others mm. and where they went on the Mur de Huy before the race which was interesting and, and the moment for her to go on the steepest part was kind of lost you wonder how aware van der Breggen was of that you know when she was pinning her to the barriers in the way that she was, um, but also interesting on Bulls Dolmans. I mean, again, on the face of it, it's a very similar story to last year when it was Van der Breggen and, and Lizzie Dagnan uh, who were up there in all the Ardennes uh, classics. And this year, the, the the cast has changed a little bit, but they just look just as strong. Yeah, and it, it just begs the question how you can beat them, really, because I mentioned their dominance in Flanders as well, and it's right through the team with Majerus controlling the race to bring um, Van der Breggen and Chantal Black back and you look at I think during Flanders at one stage you had Amy Peters in one chasing group you had Chantal Black the world champion in another and they just have that strategy absolutely nailed down and they can because of the quality of the riders they've got and I was listening to um, Rochelle Gilmore who was commentating on Flanders and she was alluding to what we had mentioned a few episodes ago when we were talking about Marianne Voss and maybe why she's not so dominant these days and that's because with women's racing now you really do need the strong team to be able to win and that's part partly because Bowles Dolmans operate that strategy so incredibly well. Um, but it was interesting that she said that she doesn't believe that van der Breggen is necessarily the strongest rider, or at least as strong a rider as her results would suggest. Again, you know, saying that she's able to benefit from the dominance of her team. And we saw it last year at Flesh Wallone, um, certainly when we were there, Richard. Lizzie put in such a huge turn at the front to finish second so it was van der Breggen who made the most of that and they're just an incredibly difficult team to beat you know uh, so many wins this season from different riders we keep saying that maybe this season will be the season where their dominance is broken it doesn't seem to be on the horizon just yet does it but I think that's why Flesh Wallon is so interesting because Moolman was only two seconds behind at the finish line and I think as much as you need a really good team in Flesh Wallon to set you up and I think like Last year when Anna won, she had a huge gap mm. when she was on the on the Muir. But I think this year what you see is the Muir can only help you so much if you have a good team. Because you can get, a good team can take you right up there. But then when that last person peels off, you really need to perform and sprint up some horrendous incline. And if you don't have it, then you're not going to win. I think that's why maybe van der Breggen only won by two seconds, where in the past she has won by... A huge amount more because if you're still together right at that point then you the team can't help you because it's it's so steep it it's so attritional and I think that's a good sign that Ashley was really strong and and only two seconds behind and who knows if if you know if if she'd been able to attack where she wanted to attack the result might well have been different but that's bike racing too and Anna van der Breggen was in the right position and and position is so important on the Moor de Huy as well and she rode an excellent race we should we should mention that uh, one of the things that Anna van der Breggen said in her post-race interview was about the team mechanic uh, Richard Stieg the uh, Bulls Dolman's mechanic who suffered a heart attack the day before the race uh, they were sharing a hotel with Team Sky and I think their mm-hmm. medical staff attended to him uh, a lot of people who have a heart attack die you know without medical attention he fortunately was lucky and survived now we know about Richard Stieg because he is one of the, the people who brings women's racing to life as well mm-hmm. as being a mechanic for the team he's fantastic to follow on Twitter because he live tweets the race and you know usually that's the be- the best coverage of women's racing is often from the back of the Bulls Dolman's car um, so he's recovering and uh, we wish him well the cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport Science in Sport fueled by science Thank you very much to Science and Sport for sponsoring the cycling podcast Femina. You can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. 
I went into Science Sport recently armed with a lot of listeners' questions uh, and I met with Dr. Rob Child, their Chief Scientific Officer, and I put some of those questions to him. Uh, let's hear one of them now. So our question, Rob, is from Morgan Fraga. I've been a recreational endurance athlete for about 10 years, splitting my time between running, cycling and swimming. This year, my husband and I are working on growing our family. What additional considerations should I have with respect to nutrition and hydration while pregnant? The first thing is focus on nutrition before you actually want to conceive. So one of the key things to consume is folic acid, which helps prevent neural tube defects. And the second thing to focus on is regularly consuming omega-3 fatty acids. So these are the fatty acids that are found in oily fish such as salmon, mackerel, fresh tuna uh, and sardines and they're actually important for neurological development in the baby. One of the things that you should avoid is vitamin A supplements because that's been related to uh, birth defects and just generally you should focus on consuming a a varied diet that includes uh, vegetables, uh, fruit, dairy products and uh, meat and fish. The easiest way to ensure that you get adequate intake of most of the vitamins and minerals uh, during pregnancy and before pregnancy is to take a a multivitamin uh, that includes a fish oil supplement to provide EPA and DHA, which are the omega-3 fats that are most important. So that was Rob Child answering Morgan Fraga's question about uh, nutrition when you're pregnant. We're still wanting more questions from you. Do send them to contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. Um, if you've got questions about your own nutrition or indeed the pros nutrition, we're going to put some questions to some writers as well. So contact at the cyclingpodcast.com. Orla, you would have uh, been interested in that answer. Well, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to, to, something to, to declare. declare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'd like to use this occasion to announce <laughs> that have, I am not pregnant. You, you have, have been, been pregnant. You have been. Yes, yes, yes. And actually that is one of the things as well. Whenever you're pregnant or I guess trying to get pregnant, it's it becomes an obsession googling the latest advice and what you can and can't eat and it changes so often and so many times over the generations and it's quite difficult to keep on top of things but yeah that was very interesting actually a good question i liked it mm, lots mm. more lots more where that came from we'll hear more of those questions in the regular podcast and in podcast femina moving on to liege baston liege ashley moulin passio we heard from earlier she was one of the strong riders in that race as well and finished just off the podium in fourth uh, we're going to hear from Amanda Spratt in a moment. She was second and at one point, you know, looked in a quite good position to maybe try and win it. You mentioned Annemiek van Vloten earlier at the Tour of Flanders. Mariana Voss at mm. liege Bastogne liege crashed and broke her collarbone and, and finished the race, which is quite remarkable. She'll mm. be out now for a bit, but pretty tough to finish the race with a broken collarbone. I know, I know, yeah, she fractured it in a crash. That's, yeah. Mm. We Again, another rider that we know to be particularly um, tough, and that just shows to what extent. I'd be crying like a baby on the side mm. of the road. Just, yeah, I, I noticed that pulling on the handlebar did not go very well. <laughs> yeah. I her, love the level of that her, understatement. Yeah. Yeah. It did not go very well, <laughs> as in, I was in effing agony. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Well, let's hear from Amanda Spratt, the Australian rider who who missed the Commonwealth Games, you know, and, and that was, as she tells us, quite a big decision. But finished second at Liège, based on Liège, and has had a, a great start to the year. Here she is, Amanda Spratt. So, Amanda, terrific result at Liège, second. But um, talk me through the, the closing stages of, of the race, if you would. Yeah, certainly very happy with second. We really knew in the race it was going to kind of all split apart probably on the Rocha Faucon climb. So the main aim there was just to try and follow and still be there in the front. When we got towards the the top of that climb, I guess there was probably 10 or 11 of us there and there were quite a few attacks and I just saw a moment and I thought, okay, sometimes, yeah, the best form of defence is to attack. So I just took my moment and got a gap straight away and And I knew it was a good situation when we have someone like Annemiek Van Vluten in the team and and she was in that group behind. So she could get a free ride and I was working at the front and um, my gap just kept going out. And I knew if I could get to St. Nicholas Climb with a decent gap, then there's a good chance I could hang on. And I knew people like Anna and Ashley would really have to to attack hard on that climb to get across to me, which they did. And Anna got across to me and I was really hoping Anna Meek would still be there, but she just, she couldn't hang on. She was behind with um, Ashley. Yeah. I think when you see the Olympic champion and world number one come across to you, then it's a little bit of nerves, but um, I'd already done a lot of work, but having uh, Anna Meek behind, I knew I could just sit on her and, and yeah, Anna was riding hard and yeah, to be honest, I was hoping I could just hang onto her wheel up that final drag, but um 
Yeah, it's only 1.4k, I think it is, up that drag to the finish line, but it felt like forever, and, and she just started going hard, and I just I couldn't hold her wheel, and she got a gap on me, and it just, yeah, it stayed that way, and, and I came second. I mean, Anna van der Breggen obviously has been completely dominant in these races, but and her team as well, and, and on paper it looks like the, the, her team is, is as strong as ever, but in that moment it looked like you were playing Bulls Dolmans at their own game a little bit with, as you say, Van Vluten behind and, and you up the road. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, probably this season in particular, um, the strength is kind of spread across more teams. So I think they're, they're, yeah, they're still getting great results, but they're not as dominant as maybe what they have been in previous seasons. You see a team like Canyon Tram as well, really attacking and mm. putting it to them. And certainly with Anna Meek and I both there in the final, we were able to do that. And I got the communication on the radio that it was only Anna Meek and Ashley behind, that, that Anna didn't have any teammates. So I knew that Anna, she... Yeah, it was up to her basically to get the results. So that meant I could just sit on her and get a free ride essentially. But um, yeah, she she was just too strong for me in the end. So you were happy in in the end, I guess, to be in the Ardennes and not on the Gold Coast at uh, the Commonwealth Games. <laughs> yeah, I, in the end, it, it really um, yeah justified my decision, I guess. Um, it was a decision that took a while to make, actually, probably a good few months. My f- coach, Gene Bates, first sort of brought out the idea in August last year, and I hated the idea at, at the time. Um, yeah, I just thought he was stupid for saying that, and um, it took a good few months of thinking about it and just trying to work out what would be best for me in my cycling career. And I'm not really young anymore. I'm at that kind of point in my career, career where I want to prioritise and, and get the most out of myself. So, yeah, I did. I chose not to put my hand up for selection. Um, yeah, Australia have a really strong group of riders anyway, so there's no guarantee I'd be there. But um, certainly coming to the Ardennes and targeting it and getting three top five finishes and the second in Liège is, yeah, it makes me very comfortable and happy that I made that decision. I mean, I know the World Championships is a big big goal for you this year. Um, the, again, the, the race in the Ardennes must make you confident for, for, for that race. Do you know the course at all have you been to look at it or will you have a look at it yeah i've actually um yeah i was quite excited when i saw it was in innsbruck and i actually took a trip there in october at the end of the season last year um i caught the train and took a did a little bike packing trip actually by myself mm. on the weekend to go and um, ride around the course so i was probably carrying uh, a little bit of off-season weight and um plus my um <laughs> bikepacking stuff so probably I don't know how many kilos extra than race day but I've ridden the course I know it's really hard um yeah it's definitely a climbers course for us um but I think having already seen it I have a good idea of what the demands are and the kind of shape I'm going to have to be in so my next goal is the Giro Giro Rosa and, and then the world's after that so certainly I think having a, a great races in the Ardennes was a really good start and certainly yeah to perform in these sort of world-class one-day races as well You've, I mean, you've seen Anna van der Breggen up close, obviously, and the world title is the one that's missing for her as well. And the Dutch team, of course, is very strong, but as you say, it's a strong Australian team as well. Um, is, is she beatable? Um, I guess that's, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, I think she's definitely beatable. Um, I think she's not superhuman. Of course, she's, yeah, she's very strong. And at the moment, I think, yeah, she's definitely the strongest rider out there. And she's a smart rider too. She knows when to use her energy and she has a great team around her. But I think everyone's still beatable um, on their day. I mean, she doesn't have a perfect race every time she lines up. So we have to take confidence in our own ability and not focus too much on, on just her. I mean, the whole Dutch team is strong. You probably wouldn't want to let too many of them get up the road either. Mm-hmm. But um, I think with Australian cycling, we've got some really strong climbers now as well. Myself, um, Shara Gillo, who was ninth in Liège, is going really well. My teammate, Lucy Kennedy, who unfortunately crashed out at Amstel Gold, but she's a really super climbing talent. So I think we can definitely go to Innsbruck with a really strong team. And you, you um, just after winning Tour Down Under this year, did you not graduate as well? Yeah, so finally about, uh, oh, took me about eight or nine years, um, I graduated, so I've been doing a Bachelor of Communications, majoring in public relations, mm. so finally graduated from that nine years later, so it's been a slow and steady one step, one subject at a time battle, but um, no, it's, yeah, it's great to get to get that done and I think the graduation ceremony is actually in July but I'm going to defer it so I can actually attend in November in Australia so that's going to be a special moment I think just to have achieved that as well. Yeah I I mean I guess uh, it must feel like a bit of a a weight off does it? 
It does, yeah. It's kind of one of those things for so many years, it's always kind of on, on the back of your mind. You're away at races and, you know, you have this assessment due or that assessment or, you know, you have these this many subjects left to go. So, yeah, to, to finally finish it, it was one of those things that just felt like a never-ending battle actually <laughs> to finish it you never felt like you were getting any closer to so to yeah to finally finish it it's a really big achievement something i'm proud of and what's next for you amanda you mentioned the the giro um is that the next big target for you yeah so the giro is the next big target for me um now i have like a little a little bit of a holiday or break i'm in switzerland now and then i go to germany um for a few more days and then we head to valencia for a team camp um and that, straight off the back of that will be Macumine Beer, the next World Tour race for me. And then everything's geared towards the Giro after that. So I'm going to have a really solid training block. Um, and then, yeah, hope to come out firing for the Giro. So it was Amanda Spratt, the uh, Mitchelson Scott rider, having a really good season and second at Liège, Bastogne Liège. As she said, that vindicated her decision to miss the Commonwealth Games, which is always a big decision for Australian riders and some other interesting stuff just about you know she's graduated finally and um that's been a long a long haul and uh and she's had a look at the world road race at Innsbruck as well so um quite like the idea of her taking off with her backpack and mm, yeah. old, old school isn't <laughs> yeah, it yeah I know I love that you, you wouldn't see any of the guys doing that would you I'm, I'm Peter struggling Sagan to think. on we had Mika Kruger on last year um the uh German professional rider and, and she's a big fan of backpacking trips mm. in the winter. She takes herself off touring as, as part of her kind of pre-season training. But you don't hear of many professional riders. Lawrence Tendam is another one who quite likes riding his bike for fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine the very concept. <laughs> but imagine doing uh, Innsbruck, of all the places, I would just go somewhere very flat. <laughs> Netherlands, just for a nice little holiday. Imagine doing a holiday, going up the hills in Innsbruck. Mm. Um, on that particular race though, Richard, um, I've got my, we're, we're recording this at my house this time around, aren't we? Um, so I didn't even have to bring it with me. I've got my soapbox ready for you to virtual, jump on top virtual of. Virtual soapbox. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you had a few things as well. One thing in particular that um, you I think this was about Flesh Malone, actually. This oh, was wasn't it? Oh, Liege Pass on the Edge. Oh. Yeah, this was Flesh Malone. Well, I'll bring a different soapbox. There's your, there's your <laughs> Flesh Malone um, soapbox then. Up oh, pop. God, well, you're just, you know, I, I, we were talking about this earlier. I, I on on social media on Wednesday morning when Flesh Alone was running, there were some tweets about comparisons between the the average speed of the first hour of the men's race and the women's race, and they were very similar, and people were extrapolating from that lots of stuff. And I just I I, I find you know talking about average speeds of road races is completely meaningless, and and a sort of and a silly road to go down, I think. You're speaking with a little less passion than you did in my yeah. kitchen earlier, Richard. I feel like you're taming this. Well, I just, I just, I just, I think it just shows a, a, a misunderstanding of, of what road racing is. You know, road racing is about crossing the line first, and that that can Outsmarting be done. Outsmarting your opponent. Mm, yeah, it can be done in else. any number of ways, and just because uh, I think the average speed of a race has very, very little to do with how hard that race is. I think my my issue with it as well is that. The comparison is exactly that, a comparison. And what I think is beautiful about women's road racing is it's not anything in, compar in comparison to men's road mm. racing. It's simply women's road racing. It has its own uh, feel, its own tempo, its own rhythm, its own characters. And I think it can be appreciated entirely separately for the men's race. And I don't know that there are too many who would look at if they're not interested in women's racing, I don't think it's because they feel they're not going fast enough, for mm. example, that there may be any number of reasons, probably a lack of exposure more than anything else. But I don't think we need to justify it on speed necessarily. I think well, also yeah. these numbers often get reeled out as a kind of, well, women should be paid just as much mm. as men. They should be respected just as, me just as much as men because they're going as fast as them. But I mean, that... There's that doesn't make any sense. Mm. Does it? it doesn't well, make any sense. You know, and then... I, also, in, in the case of Flesh Alone, it was on different roads. Mm -hmm. So com the yeah, comparison was true. even more meaningless. But the, comp the any any assessment of a road race on the basis of its average speed is, is meaningless. Because... Well, it's not anything that we ever look at at the end of a road race, even for men's racing. We don't, we don't for one second consider mm. um, whether or not 
for example, any of Valverde's wins up the Mur de Huy were better or worse than a previous one because of the speed. It's got absolutely nothing to do with it. It's how he has managed to outfox everyone else, where he made his move, how he made his move, how the team have uh, played the race. It's all of those different factors, I think, rather than the speed, isn't it? Yeah, or or you know, a world championship or an Olympic road race. Mm. The, you know, the, the the women's race can often be more exciting. Mm. And that has nothing to do with the, the speed. Um, so let's not go down that road. Of Especially for the first hour of, of all the... Well, yeah. Because, I mean, La Course, there was this stat put out about the last... Was it the last 5K of La Course last year up the Col d'Isoard? And Annemiek van Vleuten did it in, I think, as fast or faster than the... Oh, the Strava thing. The men did. I mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that that's kind of a an interesting tidbit but it doesn't really doesn't no, reflect that, anything that is more meaningful obviously yeah, because, because it's a bit more a, of a time trial her, yeah that's her yeah. In, individual effort but but still do we really want to get I don't think we really want to get into mm. comparing yeah. the, the speed that women go at with the speed that men go at because mm. I don't really it's not really relevant is no it? it's not the same race quite literally it's not the same race yeah. so no so moving on yeah. can I climb down now <laughs> you can't jump Excellent. Oh, crash. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not as good. I'm not You're as, not quite as agile as you used to be, Mr. I'm, Moore. I'm not as good at that as you are. Well, I'm just a bit, you know, I'm a bit under the weather this year. Oh, you, know. you, you, you two are carrying me. Here. I tell you what, you should have let us know that you're under under the weather, Richard. <laughs> Another thing that, that uh, um, Amanda Spratt said there, which again echoed something that Ashley Moolman said, was just about Bulls Dolmans. How, mm. uh, although the results look like Bulls Dolmans are just carrying on as they were. They perhaps there's a the, the, the perhaps being a little bit of a false gloss on things, and that the other teams clearly feel that you know things are spread a little bit more evenly, and and perhaps you know someone will come and break that 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 dominance. I mean, I think at the moment it owes a lot to to one rider in particular, Anna van der Breggen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great to see the other teams taking it to Bowles Dolmans, and that's what we've been wanting to see for the last few seasons. The fact is still, though, that both mm. Dolmans are still winning, you know, and it's not just Anna van der Breggen, it's Amy Peters who's won as well. It's um, Chantal Black who's won a World Tour race this year as well. So on the road, there's much more of a battle for sure. But regardless, it's more often than not still a Bowles Dolmans rider who is at least in the top step of the mm. podium and quite often on another step as well. Because that's the thing. It's also not just the number of victories, but it's the number mm. of riders that are up there in the top 10 in in every race it's just like a it's incredible it in that sense uh, a team not not doing so well wiggle high five um elisa longo borghini i think has been a bit below par um ashley moment mentioned earlier that you know in in, in flash one they wouldn't take responsibility for chasing and um, because they didn't feel they had a chance of winning they, they've not really been firing on all cylinders kanye sram have been riding well aggressively but um perhaps not in those three races that we've had recently um, up there as much as they would have liked. And Lisa Longoborg and he has been ill, so she's yes, um, yes. been suffering from flu. There seems to have been a flu that was going around the female peloton there um, during the classics. So she had to sit out a few races. I think Flanders, she, she sat out anyway. Um, but maybe that also shows, you know, if one rider on another team, say, for example, Canyon Tram, certainly Bowles, were to be ill, you've still got enough cards to play, you yeah. know, and, and not all teams have that strength and depth that the very, very top ones do. And Wiggle also have a lot of track riders mm. who would have been distracted by world champs. And then, like, Amy Cure did amazingly well in the on the track at the Commonwealth Games. So they have successes, but not... They haven't been having the successes on the road and not necessarily in team colours. And a few changes in the in the back room at Wiggle High Five. Donna Ray Zielinski, who mm. was their DS. We had her on the podcast last year. Very interesting uh, woman. But she was fired over the over the off-season uh, from the team. Uh, Rochelle Gilmore ringing the changes at Wiggle High Five. Alan Davis, the former professional male writer, is, is new sports director there. Uh, that seems to have ended um, in... Not not great circumstances that relationship between Ray Zielinski and and Wiggle High Five. So, um, you know, maybe those changes have had an effect on the road as well. Well, I think it's always whenever there's a, a change, it's going to take a bit of time to adapt, and especially with, I mean, someone as key as Donna, who was really a figure that could unite people and get people, everyone on the same page, keep morale high. And when uh, when someone like that leaves then it is going to take a bit of time to adapt to a, a new way of doing things, especially when, it, you know, a DS absolutely affects how a race is done, you know, what spirit a race is done. And, and when someone comes in and 
has their has a different way of doing that then it takes some time to adapt and then results will also take longer to to get the gold coast commonwealth games biggest event in the cycling year of course close to my heart the commonwealth games um, oh, uh, did you finish did you finish uh, um, uh, but we I need to stop we, with that we CNF. have it's we, not fair we have a uh, we, we have a uh, we have a a letter an audio letter what is this explain this well Orla. so um, I didn't really get to follow any of the commonwealth games because of the time difference um, I've been busy with work and whatnot. Um so I was keen to find out work and whatnot, launching her own <laughs> her own breakaway podcast yeah my own breakaway podcast i'm allowed to mention that go on i'll be doing um i'll be doing some interviews actually that will cross over with the cycling podcast femina you have launched my own podcast when orla okay met. that's enough um... <laughs> you didn't even let me finish the title of it when orla met it's a sports interview podcast very different it's not in competition um but if you like sports interviews um or sports related interviews if you like stories just human stories have a listen Don't have a listen it, after no. you've listened subscribe to, to this yeah, this, is, this, this is when orla met richard and rose and what a yeah. great time she had. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to get you on it. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. we're going to have an in-depth <laughs> chat. I'm going to dig beneath those those Scottish layers and find out what's underneath. <laughs> oh, oh, dear, oh, dear. Stop. Maybe it won't. The maybe Scottish won't. Maybe. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, so I've been a bit busy. I'm like so Iron Brew, it. made from girders. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see what's beneath that that tough steely beneath, exterior. Beneath this doer exterior, <laughs> yeah. it's a doer yeah. interior. <laughs> so that'll be the most disappointing episode of When All I Met. But no, I've got um, Sir AP McCoy, the champion jockey. I've got Pippa York in my next episode. Formerly um, Robert Miller, of course. She was absolutely brilliant. We could run a little bit of her actually on the second podcast for me now if we wanted. I've got lots of. I've got, Ma- I've got Mark Cavendish. I've got um, Lizzie Diagon coming up, and lots of non cyclists as well. But so I wanted to know how the Commonwealth Games had gone from the point of view uh, of someone down there. And so I thought, aha, friend of the cycling podcast feminine, Tiffany Cromwell, who we absolutely love here. So I asked her if she would come on. She was really keen to come on. But uh, unfortunately, with um, her travel, she stayed on a little bit after the Commonwealth Games. And she's just coming up north to the Northern Hemisphere today. So um, she was stopping off in Dubai. And I had the little idea of sending her a series of questions via voice notes, which she kindly agreed to take part in. So it's a bit of an unusual way to interview someone I sent her the voice notes yesterday she replied when she was in Dubai today so I'm not sure where she was if she was at the airport I presume so um, on her way back up here this is Tiffany Cromwell talking about the Commonwealth Games and what's coming up next for her Tiffany, thank you for agreeing to this uh, rather unconventional way of doing an interview. Uh, Firstly, congratulations on the Commonwealth Games gold. You were team captain, of course, for Chloe Hosking, giving her the final lead out that launched her to the line for the win. Talk us through that race, if you don't mind, and just how much that gold medal meant, especially after Chloe's crash in Flanders the day before she was due to fly over there. Thanks very much for having me back on the cycling podcast. Yeah, so obviously the Commonwealth Games, it was a very, very special race, you know. I don't think it quite hit home how special it would be until I landed back in Australia. We couldn't have asked for, you know, a better race of from the plan to how we executed it to the way that the team rode to having Chloe win the gold. Um, yeah, it was, you know, a different type of field to what we we're perhaps used to, you know, definitely a much smaller field and a different dynamic with a number of track riders in there and not a lot of riders who we'd perhaps know um, so much about and used to race in week in, week out back in Europe. But it meant it had an added element to, you know, working out the tactics and how we want to race our race and what possible surprises we might be faced with. The course itself was, it was it was a good course. In the end, it was quite suburban, starting and finishing along the beachfront, but there was, you know, a couple of short but quite steep climbs. So it made selective enough without it being too difficult that completely blew the peloton apart. Um, we went in with a very, very strong plan you know we want to make the race hard we didn't want to just roll around for a sprint because there was a couple of track riders in there in particular um who we knew could potentially have a fast finish so we preferably wanted to get rid of them before the final so yeah it was you know the goal was to ride those climbs in the middle quite hard control any breakaways and you know if we need to send someone with a move we were covering all those bases and then give a perfect lead out for chloe obviously as team captain my role was to you know look after things 
make the difficult calls if they had to be made and my one most most important role was that final lead out to take her from about 300 go to 150 and you know the girls did an incredible job um we still had four riders in the last eight I think it was and it was a pretty stiff headwind coming along that beachfront as we did the last 600 meters to the line and Kat Garfield put in a huge turn you know we knew we could rely on her with her time trial skills and then Sarah Roy took over and then the Welsh came up on our left and I did get worried for a moment because they started to come over us and that was the point where I knew I had to go and luckily you know they had mistimed it because of the strong headwind I was able to claw back and get Chloe up to that 150 meter to go and then when she launched you know there was no coming back and and you know it's truly was you know a team performance and like everyone pitched in you know there was an incredible atmosphere between us girls you know the team that we had there I'd probably never been on an Australian team with that kind of good dynamic before and yeah it's just so nice to be a part of and to share with those girls. For anyone in the northern hemisphere who wasn't able to watch much of the games live or for those from elsewhere who don't really actually follow them how were the Commonwealth Games and how much does a medal there and gold in particular matter to you and to the rest of the team? Yeah, so I think I touched on how the Commonwealth Games were a little bit just before, but, you know, Commonwealth nations know how big the Commonwealth Games are. They come around once every four years, so it's similar characteristics of the Olympics. There's the um, village, everyone has a different events, you come together, you interact with different nationalities, and, yeah, the the general public know that. You talk to them and you might say you race Tour of Flanders, you might race Liège or any of the big cycling races, and they won't know what that are. Whereas you talk to the average person on the street and you say, I went to Commonwealth Games. They know what that is. So I know you're on your way back up to Europe very shortly. What's next on the agenda for you? What are your upcoming targets? Yeah, as we're speaking, I'm halfway or three quarters of the way back to Europe. Um, I just flew home from Adelaide to Dubai overnight and I'm just in Dubai for the day having the last little bit of relax before on to Nice tomorrow and then, yeah, back to work, back to my Kenyan tram team. I only have two days home and then I'm up to Luxembourg for GP LC Jacobs. So that will be the first race back with the team. Following Luxembourg, I'll be up to the UK for Tour de Yorkshire. This race I'm pretty excited about. You know, it's I think it's the third edition for the women and every year it's grown. This year it's a two-day race and I hear the second stage is very, very hard. But um, certainly the first stage I'd like to have a crack at. And, you know, I'm very excited for that race because cycling is pretty massive in Yorkshire and again it's huge crowds and stuff like that so I'm really looking forward to that. And just off the bike congratulations on your new clothing range Ode to the Sun with Rafa. I hadn't realised you'd studied fashion actually. Um, I'd like to know how all of that's gone uh, but also whether the fact that we're seeing that kind of investment in women's cycling or certainly at least in a female cyclist and the branding and the marketing that comes with it is a sign of where we are in the sport now. I don't think we would have seen that a few years ago would we? Thank you. Yeah, the Ode to the Sun collection was was really exciting to finally get that launch. You know, I studied fashion when I finished school. I never completed it because when I finished school, I also started travelling the world to, for my cycling, but did study like the fundamentals that I needed for fashion, you know, from pattern making to colour theory to garment construction to computer-aided design. So that kind of gave me the fundamentals to go out and, you know, and have a knowledge of what it takes to sort of develop clothing. And, and I actually spent a little bit of time working with Cycling Apparel Line many, many years ago, just doing some of the graphic work. So and dabbled in doing freelance designs from time to time. So yeah, it's always been an interest of mine. And then, you know, when we partnered with Rafa, very early on, I went to them, I say, you know, talked about my interest, said, hey, you know, if there's an opportunity, I'd love to do something together. And obviously they loved it. Um, they were, you know, really motivated to do something together and it took a bit of time and a few discussions and I met with their designers and then finally we got to the point where we were ready to do something together. And it's exciting for what the, um, for the women's market. There is more and more out there for female athletes, I think, female cyclists. Um, definitely three, four, five years ago, it was very, very limited what women could get. The designs were not so nice. The cuts, there wasn't a great investment into developing things that were for women. Um, I, I feel like more and more brands are reaching out and they realise there is that gap in the market and there is a need for it. And with more and more women getting onto bikes, um, 
they're wanting beautiful kit and kit that fits them as well. So, you know, the likes of Rafa leading the way. And as I said, you know, there's a number of other brands out there that are doing great things. A number of small ones out of Australia as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a growing market and hopefully there'll be more of it. And hopefully this is the first of maybe a few collections that I can do together with Rafa. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our main sponsor at the Cycling Podcast Femina. You can get your Pedalers to Charm t-shirt at rafa.cc or go to thecyclingpodcast.com shop. We heard just before the break there from Tiffany Cromwell and before that Orla gave a plug for her new podcast series. Jonathan, if you just, just cut that, that <laughs> stuff out, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, no, um, we heard from Tiffany with her, her her letter from her travels back to Europe. We'll see her back here uh, soon. She's writing Tour de Yorkshire, isn't she, coming up? She is. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to catch up with her there. Great, great. Um, now, just before we, we finish this month's episode, um, a tweet caught my eye uh over the weekend from Lauren Rowney, the former rider, and as I now know, former DS at Trek Drop. She's started her role there at the start of the year. I hadn't realised that she's actually now left Trek Drop, so that was uh, about seven or eight minutes into the call after I'd been asking her about how it was going. <laughs> <laughs> the All bo- the hard A bit of a bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> bit of a bombshell, but she's, she's left, so um, that's, that's a shame that it didn't work out there. Um, but she did tweet over the weekend about Liege Bastogne Liege and Flesh Alone, both Races organised by ASO, of course, who organised Tour de France, Paris-Roubaix and other major races. Um, Lauren asked, could someone please help me understand why it is that the UCI continues to support ASO races? This is UCI Women's World Tour. As World Tour races, when clearly they don't give a damn, year after year with the same old question, why is there no coverage? Um, Well, it was a very good question, so I called up Lauren and just asked what prompted her to to tweet that because it, people complain a lot about the lack of TV coverage of Flesh Alone and Liege Best on Liege and the 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 general uncertainty confusion over La Course and what it is and and you know the format and so on and there is this bigger question about ASO's care for women's cycling how much they really are invested in it how much they want to promote it and you know whether those races should actually be women's world tour races so here's some of what lauren had to say look i think where some of the frustration stems from is is a few things one i'm I'm an ex-rider so i understand how important it is for sponsors in the sport to have more racing live the fact that fans are demanding it as well as you know us riders the teams But the thing with the ASO, and I guess I don't have a grudge against them, but I definitely dislike them more from working alongside them last year. So nothing was really mentioned about the live coverage. And every time we brought it up in a Skype conversation with one of the ASO people, um, it was kind of like, oh, yes, there'll be more on that. There'll be more on that. Then the day came where I was at Flesh Wallon and it was like, all right, I showed up to the start finish area and I thought, okay, are we are we having any live coverage? And then they said, no, there's there's not going to be. Like there is a, a motorbike out there, but we won't be showing anything. And I tried to understand why. The guy who was sort of in charge of my role was like, well, the TV stations just don't want it. So we, we can't, we can't sh- sell it to them. So that's it. Story done. A lot of writers do share the same opinion. I mean, I did a podcast with Ashley Mormon last year with on Vox Women and she was saying the same thing like why do we continue to support these races that don't support us when we have 2.2 races um, or 2.1 like the Healthy Aging Tour which are investing the money and showing the, the races live From your dealings with the ASO did you feel there was anybody there who really cared about the women's racing? No it's just that it's still that French old school mentality it's a boys club and it just feels like nothing's going to... They're like Evil Corp. Nothing seems to be changing. If the women don't get anything really from ASO, you know, could it, would it be feasible, do you think, that they would vote with their feet and not, not take part in these events? So you have the Cycling Alliance, where is uh, the union for the women's peloton, and they would like to see a union happen for the team side of things. So it would be where the team owners and the directors came together and 
basically came up with what they wanted to achieve for the sport. I guess if that was the case and we could form this union for the teams, then we could say, we're all going to stand together. We're not going to support these races because they're giving us nothing in return for the sport. And then basically go to the UCI and say, we don't want these races in the world tour. And there are races that have the potential to be very you know, meaningful and and to have a big audience. Um, and we've seen we've seen the viewing figures for some of the the races that have been broadcast this year, and they're they're very encouraging. You know, there's a, there's an opportunity that ASO don't seem to want to to grasp. Indeed, and that's why I think it's bullshit that they say that you know it, that the races don't get the views because, like you said, the ratings are there. It's evident that people want to watch these races and it complements what's happening in the men's races because I don't know about you, but really I only tune in with about 100 k's to go. I mean, show the women's race during, before, and then feed into the men's race and then you have a nice afternoon of viewing. So Lauren there sort of suggesting that, you know, the only meaningful action to take would be to to vote with your feet and for the top teams and riders not to actually ride the so supported organized races um until things like tv coverage are taken care of i mean over the last week we've had an amstel gold race uh flesh flown liege by liege amstel gold was was excellent again and mm-hmm. a lot of riders last year said that amstel gold which was a new race in the women's world tour last year was really good it was well organized well supported, there was TV coverage, um, and some effort seemed to have gone into putting on a good race for the women. Whereas things are sadly lacking, not just in the lack of TV coverage, but in other areas too, in the ASO races, it does seem. But it's so difficult because, I mean, a lot of the smaller races, like Lauren says, a lot of the smaller races can get a helicopter up, can get several motos uh, in the race, and ASO really has no, and a lot of, you know, people say, oh, TV production is so expensive. And ASO really have uh, no excuse because they're the ones with all the money. And I think sometimes the UCI can be a little weak in coming down hard on ASO because ASO have so much power. Having the Tour de France it, it means that you control so much of cycling by just having one race, but like the biggest race. So I think they can be a little bit of a light touch when it comes to the ASO. There's no consistency across the ASO races anyway. We've got the Tour de Yorkshire coming up, which will be, as I understand, live streamed at least. It may be live on TV as well, the women's race. Um, but certainly you will be able to follow it live. That's an ASO race, but that to me appears to be down to Gary Verity more than anything else. So the race organiser. So when you look at um, Flesh, you look at Liège, Baston Liège, that's the race organiser who is not putting that on, ASO are allowing them to do that. They're allowing them to get away with it. And in turn, UCI are allowing ASO to not put the pressure on the race organisers. Um, I mean, it's it's a struggle to even find what the exact criteria is for it to be a women's world tour race. I've been trying to find what the media requirements are. All I can see is newspaper reports and magazine reports on what it is. I can't find an, an article actually on um, the UCI's website itself, but there was uh, an article uh, from a few years back talking about the what was then the new women's world tour tour um, and it looks like the expectation was that for a race to be women's world tour that they're expected to provide live tv or streaming of the event or a highlights package now there is a massive mm. massive difference between live streaming and a highlights package because the highlights packages aren't even 10 minutes long i mean we were talking about some of the highlights of um the arden races and you wouldn't even have known that Ashley Milman Passio was taking part in some of the races and never mind an- animating them in the way that she was. If you, if you, you, you're relying on somebody else's interpretation of the race. Um, so it, in my mind, it's, it's just not good enough. Uh, there's no, there's no, there's no reason that Flesh and Liège can't exist as races. I personally think it's a good thing. I really do. And I think they're wonderful races. And I keep going back to this um, issue of narrative and it's an easy narrative to follow when when there is a history to the men's race. You can transpose that to an extent onto the women's race. But they don't have to be World Tour races and you can withhold that status until they provide live streaming. It's really not difficult. And as you say, we keep saying how expensive television production is. Television production is very, very expensive to do well. However, cheap live streaming is cheap. You stick a camera, however basic that camera might be, onto one motorbike. 
that follows the race. And if that's the only angle you've got, you've still got an angle of the race. Then we can improve on that. But that in itself is really not expensive. And there is no excuse for not doing that other than sheer laziness and not giving enough importance to women's racing. And the UCI, if a race organiser is not giving enough importance to women's race, why on earth do they have world tour status? It's up to the UCI. And it also begs the question, what does it mean to be a women's world tour race? Because they've also got this situation this year when they've got tour of california which is a women's world tour race going on at the same time as bira i think mm. Mm. and so you've got so many teams big teams bowls dolmans for instance where the defending champion of tour of california is anna van der bregen she's not even going to defend her title and so when you've got overlapping races and races which aren't that that don't look the same they don't have the same organizational standards then what does it mean to be mm. a women's world tour race would it not be better to be a really well organized race like healthy aging tour that isn't women's world tour and the frustrating thing is you know in speaking to amanda spratt and ashley moment passio and hearing from them how those races unfolded especially liege based on the edge actually because that sounded like a really exciting finale mm-hmm. those last three or four climbs there was a lot of a lot of things happening you know pauline from Prevost was away there was counter-attacking behind her there were groups splitting it sounded really exciting. It's a shame that the Tour of Flanders was the race that we were able mm. to watch because it was the least exciting. You know, Anna van der Breggen went away quite early and, and won the race. Uh, Liege Basel Liege sounds like a real, it was a real cracker. But, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around here, it doesn't make a sound. Mm. Now, our old pal, Dam Van Reef, a professor at University of Leuven, he tweets a lot. He's our old pal. Because He's he, our old pal already, yeah. You mentioned him in the last podcast. I make him our old pal. Um, <laughs> Need the never friends. spoken to him, never met him, but you know, he, we I, make friends very easily. I actually emailed him the other day because I thought he'd be an interesting guy to get on the on the podcast. He declined the invitation, but... Um, <laughs> That's how our old pal yeah, has treated. But he, did, he did send me a very interesting... That's why he's an old pal, not a, not a current one. Current did, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our former send, friend. He did send me a very interesting paper that he's written about about this um but he tweeted about the tv audiences for the women's amstel gold race uh, in flanders on spores at 502 thousand people watched live coverage of the women's amstel gold race that was 76 percent of the audience for the men's 502 thousand is it now i i am quite across television figures and these days that is a huge audience huge mm. half let's, a million let's hope it's accurate um <laughs> in the netherlands uh only a thousand more watched the men, the women's race than they watched the men's race on Eurosport in the Netherlands. It was quite a small audience, but more pe- more people watched the women's race than the men's race. Um, and in Denmark, uh, thirty nine thousand people watched the women's race, which seems like a pretty good figure as well. I feel like as well we should maybe caveat our earlier. Um, protestation that we shouldn't be comparing men's and women's yeah. racing and now we're <laughs> yeah. comparing the viewing figures but I think this yeah, is much more relevant different. That's I, different. I know it is that's know, interesting Richard but what speed the, were they doing I'm, I'm, <laughs> no no I'm comparing the interest I'm comparing the interest in it um, maybe that's why they, why they had more viewers though because it lasted longer because they were going yeah, more but the, slowly, so we had more time to watch <laughs> no but the point is that you put it on and people will clearly will clearly watch it uh, now listen we heard from Tiffany Cromwell who left us uh, voice messages you can now leave us a voice message Whoa. for the podcast Femina. I'm really excited about Le- this. I can't wait. No, if I quite... was a listener, I'd be straight on. Yeah. <laughs> I might do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put well, on my best with that, Scottish, with that accent. Scottish accent. <laughs> Although it's flirty Mackay here. <laughs> um, Although it's... Um, I, can't oh think, I can't even think of a you've Scottish fa- name. You've fallen at the first hurdle. <laughs> yeah. It's um, Iona Shinoa. Iona Bike. <laughs> Um, it's uh, oh god okay oh no uh, okay it's Iona on. McBike here let's have some calm here uh, the number to call don't call it though don't don't phone us up um, because nobody will answer is plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five that's plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five now what you have to do what we, what we can accept on that number are basically whatsapp voice messages um so you have to add the phone number to your contacts open whatsapp open a new chat and then press and hold the microphone and we'll get your message so please do 
send us some messages. It's like an old answering machine. I know, I it know. Is. Yeah, just a little bit of retro. Tell mm. us what you think, and if it's broadcastable, mm, we might well clean. we may well broadcast it next month. Um, that's all I think for this month. Anything else to um, declare? Nothing else to declare. I'm still no not pregnancy. Pregnant. <laughs> yeah. During Are a you program. Richard? Are you pregnant? No. You're right. Um, I'm not. We're just establishing everybody's level of. Yeah. You are showing, but well, you're not pregnant. Um, I'm a bit worried about where that question might be coming from. <laughs> anyway, uh, just straight in my back. Um, <laughs> Where are you off? You're off to the Tour de Yorkshire? I'm hopefully off to the Tour de Yorkshire as long as I'm not uh, sent on a last minute mission to the Giro d'Italia. But I should be off to the Tour de Yorkshire. I'll catch up with uh, Tiffany Cromwell, certainly. Um, Lizzie Dignan, who I'm also interviewing in depth for my own. Oh my God. (laughs) And um, and whoever else is there, I'll try to grab Anna van der Breggen. Danny Rowe's going to be there. Chantal Black, I think, is going to be there. It is a stellar field at the Mm. Tour de Yorkshire. So hopefully I'll gather some um, interesting material from Up North. Great. Off anywhere, Rose? Maybe Yorkshire as well, actually. Oh, see you there. Maybe Yorkshire. And then I'm doing the men's Giro d'Italia. I'm not even allowed if... I'm not sure I'm allowed to even say that on the podcast Feminine. No, I'm doing Don't that as well. Don't worry. There you so, go. Well, I'll see you out there. Well, I'm, see you I'm there. staying true to the cause then. Sticking Great. with women's cycling. Well, we'll reconvene. Unless I'm pulled for the Giro. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll, all, we'll just meet up there. See you all at the Giro and we'll talk about women's cycling. Well, <laughs> wherever we happen to be, let's reconvene in a month or less than a month and do the next podcast feminar shall we oh let's do it in the meantime thank you Orla thank you both thank you Rose thanks very much guys you're listening to the cycling podcast Femina in association with Rafa Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses across the globe <laughs>